بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Abi ini dan lain mahu dia orang yang Allah semaskan semua semua itu. Nanti ya, perspective yes, terpakai mana, terpisahkan, terbangkan. Abi mahu abi share sama, abi respect mahu. These are organisations and brothers and sisters in Islam. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much to all the members for their presence. We really appreciate it. This will be Dr. Zaki's night, his last lecture in Durban. He will be leaving today at 1.30 for Ladysmith. And then he's going on to his next part of his tour to Cape Town, Johannesburg. Botswana, back to Johannesburg, then Mauritius, and then back to Mumbai. So we have a lot of sympathy for our guests. We still have to go to a lot of guests there. I would uh, like to start off the proceedings yesterday by asking Sheikh Shema who was raised from the Quran to open the work the Glorious Quran, the second from the Glorious Quran.
فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ You bring the message of the Holy Quran alive in our hearts, in our minds, and we can only reminisce what the experience of our beloved Prophet must have been when these words were recited to him in the cave of Hira for the first time. In summary, you have recited some of the beautiful verses of the Quran. In fact, all the verses are beautiful. But the poignant verse that you recited, who is better in speech than one who calls to Islam who calls to Allah and, and who proclaims that I am a Muslim? Can there be something much more beautiful than that? I don't want to take too much of your time. We have with us to Mujahid for Islam, Dr. Zakir Naik and Dr. Shaheb. They are both from the Islamic Research Foundation. One of the foundations, particularly Dawa in a comparative sense. Dr. Zakir Naik, Mr. Dida described Dr. Zakir Naik as data plus. And this says a lot about him. We we are indeed honored to have him with us because he keep on saying that Mr. Didat has inspired him. And and to us it is a great honor to have him with us here today. That is in our presence. And today he will inspire us. And this is how the chain of events take place, that we, we continue to pass on the gifts in the name of Allah. The first generation and the second generation and the third generation and many generations of Muslims that came from the motherland India, they came here and they planted the seeds of Islam. Others came, they irrigated. Some of us, this generation plucked the fruits of this, of, of all the work that have been done. We are very happy to see that Dr. Zakir Naik's generation is now coming to revive Islam in this country. Once again coming from Mumbai, once, once a day coming from the motherland. They are taking a great lead today in the Dawah and uh, we are extremely happy to see that the movement for Islam is alive in each and every part of the world today. And it is this message of hope and this message of resurgence that we feel whenever we meet our brothers from different parts of the world. Dr. Dr. Zaki Naik will speak. Can Islam offer more to humanity than religion? Can Islam offer more to humanity than religion? What is it that Islam can offer humanity? I just want to say briefly that the two doctors with us today have given up their medical professions and they have committed themselves to the cause of the Dawah. 
they spend more of their time outside. The, Dr. Zaki might spend more of his time outside this country than inside this country. That is the extent of his itinerary. We are indeed honored to have you with us here today, sir. You will also find amongst the audience here today are some of the students who completed a one-month course in Dawa at the IPCI a month ago. We also would like to welcome those students. And uh, I think you should feel honored that today you are uh, having the opportunity of listening to Dr. Zaki Naik. With much further ado, I'll ask our distinguished guest to address us, Jazakum Mubarak. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala Rasulillah. Wa ala ali wa sabi ajmain. Amma abad. Auz billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Ya ayuhu al-nasu. Inna khalaqnaku min zakin wa unsa wa jannakum. Shubaw wa qabaila li ta'arifu. Inna kramakum. Inna Allah yatkakum. Inna Allah alimun kabir. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Rabbi shuhali sadri. Wa yassir li amri. Wa halul ugdata min lisani. Yafka wa kawli. Brother Fawad, Dr. Shweb, my respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. It's a pleasure once again to be in South Africa, especially in the IPCI. And this is my fourth visit to South Africa. And one of the main reasons for all my visits to South Africa and during this visit is to visit Sheikh Ahmad Dida. I call him Uncle Ahmad Dida. And IDM had requested me a couple of years back to come for a lecture tour. And one of the reasons that I accepted seeing a slot that was free in my schedule two years back was that I would have the opportunity to meet Uncle Ahmad Dida again. And in this trip, the first person I met was Sheikh Dida, and again I met him before yesterday. And after Uncle saw one of my latest video cassettes on non wish debate, he said, with tears rolling out, he can communicate through a board, as all of you may be aware, that my son, you have achieved in four years what took me more than 40 years. And I said, Uncle, it is because of him that I was able to do it. Because he gave it us, he gave it to us on a platter. Otherwise, I would have taken 44 years. Uncle did the job. We have to take the advice, take the good thing that he has given us, and we have to move ahead. It is because of Uncle that I am here today. Otherwise, I would have been in the surgery. He is the one who inspired me. It was my ambition to become a doctor, and the ambition of my mother that I should become a surgeon somewhat similar to Dr. Chris Barnard. As you may be aware, Dr. Christian Barnard also hails from South Africa. And he's the person who did the first heart transplant. So when I got involved in the field of Dawa after being inspired by Sheikh Ahmed I asked my mother, what would you like me to be? Dr. Chris Barnard or Sheikh Ahmed Didad? So my mother said, both. But now when I asked my mother, would you prefer me to become like Dr. Chris Barnard or Sheikh Didad? She tells me, I can sacrifice a thousand Christian Bernard for one Sheikh Didad, Alhamdulillah. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may give health to our beloved Uncle Sheikh Didad. And it's because of Didad, Uncle Didad and IPCI, that I have changed my profession from curing the body to curing the heart and soul. The topic that I've been given to speak today is can Islam offer more to humanity than other religions? <clears throat> if you analyze all the major religions, they basically teach good things. The basis of almost all the major religions, they teach you good things. But the difference between Islam and the other major religions is that Islam shows you a way how to achieve a state of that good things. It shows you a way how to achieve those good things. For example, all major religions teach you that you should not rob. Hinduism says you should not rob. Christianity says you should not rob. Islam says the same. 
So what's the difference between Islam and the other religions? The difference is Islam shows you a way how to achieve a state in which people will not rob. Islam is a system of zakat. That is every rich person who has a saving of more than, than the sub level, 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that excess wealth in charity every lunar year. If every rich human being in this world gives a zakat, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. And after that, the glorious Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38, As to the thief, be it a man or a woman, chop off his or her hand as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many non-Muslims will say, chopping off the hands in this age of science and technology? Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless law. <coughs> Today, one of the most advanced countries in the world is America. It is USA. But did you know, USA, USA has one of the highest rates of crime in the world. One of the highest rates of robbery and theft. I am asking a question. That if you implement the Islamic Sharia in USA, that is every rich person, who has a saving of more than 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that excess wealth in charity every lunar year. And after that, if any person robs, man or woman, chop off his or her hand as a punishment, I am asking you a question, will the rate of robbery and theft in America, will it increase, will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia and you get results. That's why I say that Islam, besides speaking good things, it also shows you a way how to achieve the state of goodness. Time may not permit us to go into all the details because of the limited time that I've been given to speak. I'll just give you a couple of more examples. All the major religions say that you should not molest a girl, that you should not rape a woman. Christianity says that, Hinduism says that, Islam says the same. But the difference between Islam and the other religions is Islam shows you a way how to achieve a state in which people will not molest or rape any girl. People, mainly the speakers, they talk about hijab for the women, hijab for the women, hijab in Islam for women. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran first speaks about the hijab for the man and then for the woman. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. The moment a man looks at a woman, any brazen thought comes in his mind, he should lower his case. There was one of a Muslim brother of ours who was staring at a girl for a long time. So I told him, brother, what are you doing? It's not allowed in Islam. So he told me that a prophet said, the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited. I have not completed half my glance. What did the Prophet mean when he said the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited? That doesn't mean that you look at a girl for 10 minutes without blinking and saying that I haven't completed my glance. That if you unintentionally look at a woman, don't intentionally look at her to feast on her beauty. The next verse speaks about the hijab for the woman. Surah Nur chapter number 24 verse number 31 says, Say to the living woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty, and display not her beauty except what appears ordinary of, and to draw her veil over the bosom except in front of her husband, her father, her son, and a big list of marim who is not allowed to marry is given. And the criteria for hijab is given in the Quran, the Sahih Hadith, the basic six criteria. The first is the extent which differs between the man and the woman. For the man, it's from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands of the wrist. The remaining five criteria are the same. The second is, the clothes they wear, it should not be so tight so that it reveals the figure. Third, it should not be transparent so that you can see through. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. And sixth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And the reason for hijab for the woman is given in the glorious Quran in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 59, which says, O Prophet, tell your wives and the believing women that when they go abroad, they should put on the cloak so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. Suppose two beautiful, equally beautiful, and one of the twin sisters, she is wearing the Islamic hijab, 
complete body cover except the face and the hands up to the wrist. And the other twin sister, she is wearing the western clothes, mini skirt or shorts. And they're walking down the streets of Durban and if round the corner there is a hooligan, there is a hoodlum who's waiting for a catch, who's waiting to tease a girl. I am asking a question, which girl will it tease? Will it tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab or will it tease the sister who's wearing the mini sister who's wearing the mini skirts and shorts? Quran rightly says that hijab has been prescribed for the woman to prevent her from being molested. And after that, the Islamic Sharia says, if any man rapes any woman, capital punishment, death penalty. Non-Muslims say, death penalty? In this age of science and technology? Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless law. But when I pose this question to my non-Muslim brothers, and I pose to thousands of them, that suppose, unfortunately, God forbid, someone rapes your mother, or rapes your wife, and if you are made the judge, and the rapist is born in front of you, what punishment will you give him? And believe me, all of them said we will put him to death. Some went to the extreme of saying we will torture him to death. So why these double standards? Someone rapes your mother, your wife, you want to put him to death. Someone rapes somebody else's wife or mother, you say death penalty is a barbaric law. You know in America, the country which is supposed to be the most advanced in the world, according to the statistics of FBI, 1990. In the year 1990 alone, 102,555 cases of rape took place. And the report said only 16 persons were reported. So the complete figure you have to multiply by 6.25 and we get a total of 640,968 rapes that took place in America in 1990. If you divide by 365 the number of days, you get an average of 1,700 and 54 cases of rape that took place every day on average in the year 1990 alone. The other statistics of 1996, the U.S. Department of Justice, Crime Bureau, it says on average every day 2,713 cases of rape took place in the year 1996. 1990, 1,756, 54, and in 1996, 2,713, maybe the Americans got more bold. And the 1996 statistics says every 32 seconds, one case of rape is taking place. You know, we have been here for the past half an hour. Already, already 60 rapes have taken place in America from the time we are here in this auditorium. 60 rapes have already been taken place. I am asking you the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia in America, that is, Every man, when he looks at a woman, any unashamed thought, any brazen thought comes in his mind, he should lower his case. And the woman, her complete body should be covered, except the face and the hands of the wrist. And after that, if any man rapes a woman, capital punishment, I am asking the question, will the rate of rape in America, will it increase, will it remain the same, or will it decrease? It will decrease. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia and you get results. That is the reason I say that Islam, besides teaching good things, shows you a way how to achieve the state of goodness. All the major religions, theoretically, they speak about universal brotherhood. But Islam is the only religion which practically implements it in its day-to-day -day life. And this country, as we all know, previously there was apartheid law, now it has been abolished, again theoretically, but practically it yet is there in most of the people living here. Islam has the solution. And I start my talk by quoting a verse from the Glorious Quran, from Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 13, which says, Ya ayyuhal nasu inna khalaknaakum min zakrin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum shu'ubam wa qaba'ila alit a'rafu inna kramakum min the lohiyat kaakum inna allaha alimun khabir. O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah, who has taqwa. The criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
it's not caste it's not color it's not sex it's not wealth it is taqwa it's god consciousness it's piety and in islam we practically demonstrate universal brotherhood minimum five times every day and referring to the salah then we offer salah our beloved prophet said this mentions from abu daud boy number one in the book of salah chapter number 245 hadith number 666 a prophet said before starting the salah stay in your rows stand shoulder to shoulder close in the gap do not leave any opening for the devil the prophet wasn't referring to the devil which we see in the museum with two horns and a tail he was referring to the devil of racism of caste of color of wealth irrespective whether you're black or white whether yellow or brown when you stand for salah you stand shoulder to shoulder irrespective of the rich or poor whether king or pauper when you stand for salah you stand shoulder to shoulder this is practical implementation of universal bedou in islam and during hajj which is the biggest annual gathering in the world our 2 and 1/2 million people come from different parts of the world from america from canada from uk from singapore from malaysia from south africa from india on the call of labbaik allahumma labbaik here we are oh my lord here we are and the men they are dressed up in two pieces of unsewn cloth which is perfectly white you cannot identify the person standing next to you whether he is a king or a pauper universal brotherhood and in front of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our color has got no value our wealth has got no value it's not the criteria the criteria for judgment is taqwa it's god consciousness it's piety it is righteousness that's the reason i say that what islam has given to humanity practically if you compare is far superior to any other religion other religions do speak about good things but islam shows you a way how to practically implement it in your life and the glory of quran is the last and final revelation of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which was revealed to the last and final message of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and if any book has to be the word of god and if it's supposed to be for eternity quran was not revealed only for the muslims or for the arabs it was revealed for the whole of humanity it was not only meant for a particular group of people or for a particular time period it's meant till eternity for any book to prove it's a word of god it should stand the test of time previously it was the age of miracles and the quran alhamdulillah is the miracle of miracles then came the age of literature and poetry muslim the non muslim the like they are claim the glory is quran to be the best arabic literature on the face of the earth today is the age of science and technology alhamdulillah even in this age quran proves itself to the word of god and it will always prove itself to the word of god the quran has attributed a lot to science and technology from the 8th to 12th century it was known as the dark ages dark for the europeans but the muslims the arabs they were on the top of the world the quran is not a book of science S C I E N C E, but it's a book of signs. S I G N S. It's a book of ayats, and there are more than six thousand ayats, signs in the glorious Quran, out of which more than a thousand speak about signs. Quran speaks about astronomy, about the Big Bang. That we know, you know, there was a group of scientists a couple of decades earlier who said that a universe came into existence. and they described it that initially there was one prime in nebula then there was a second separation a big bang which gave rise to galaxies planets sun and the earth we live in quran gives this message in a nutshell in surah anbiya chapter 21 was the mutakki way says awalam yaral ladina kafaru do not the unbelievers see anna samawati wal arda kanat ratan fatnahuma that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder The Quran says in Surah Fussilat, chapter number forty-one, verse number eleven, that the initial celestial matter was in the form of smoke, which science has discovered recently. Previously, we thought that the world was flat, and we were afraid to venture too far. It was only in 1597 when Sir Francis Drake 
when he sailed around the earth that he proved that the world was spherical. Quran says in Surah Naziyat, chapter 79, verse number 30, Wal ard dahaha. And thereafter, we have made the earth egg shape. And we know today that the world is not completely round like a ball. It is geospherical in shape, flattened from the poles. And the haha is derived from the Arabic word duya, which means an egg. And it doesn't refer to a normal egg, it specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And we know the egg of an ostrich is also geospherical in shape. Quran says that the light of the moon is reflected light instead of Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 61, which that comes more recently. When I was in school, I was taught that the earth and the planets, they revolved and they rotated. But the sun, it was stationary. It did not rotate about its own axis. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, It is Allah who has created the night and the day. The sun and the moon, each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. And today we have come to know, with the help of an equipment, that the sun has got black spots, when you can have the image on a tabletop, and these black spots take about 25 days to complete one rotation, indicating the sun takes 25 days to complete one rotation. Quran says in Surah Dhariya, chapter 15, verse 47, 400 years ago, that our universe is expanding which was first described by Edwin Hubble just a couple of decades earlier. Quran speaks about physics, that an atom also can be divided, which we didn't know previously. Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. How does the water rise, flows into the interior, fall down as rain, and the water flows back in several places in the Quran. The Quran describes the water cycle in great detail. In Surah Al-Sumur, chapter 39, verse number 21. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 18. In Surah Hijr, chapter 15, verse number 22. In Surah Nur, chapter 24, verse 43. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 48. In Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 9. In Surah Araf, chapter 7, verse 57. In Surah Raw, chapter number 13, verse number 17. In Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 40 to 50. In Surah Fatir, chapter 35, verse number 9. It's mentioned in several places. In Surah Yasin, chapter 36, verse 34. In Surah Jasha, chapter 45, verse number 5. In Surah Khaf, chapter number 50, verse 8 to 9. In Surah Wakhya, chapter 56, verse 67 to 80. In several places. In Surah Mulk, chapter 16, verse number 30. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. The Quran has given a lot to the modern society today. The Quran speaks about geology, that the mountains have got roots. In Surah Nabah, chapter 17, verse number 6, it says the mountain prevents the earth from shaking. In Surah Amga, chapter 21, verse number 31, Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse number 10, and Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 15. The Quran speaks about oceanology. There are two types of water, sweet and salt. Between them there is a barrier. Though they meet, they would not mix. They are forbidden to be just passed. In Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 53. The Quran speaks about biology that they have created every living thing from water, which we have come to know recently in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 30. Quran speaks of botany, that the plants have got sex with male and female, in Surah Taha, chapter number 50, verse 53. The Quran speaks about zoology, the lifestyle of the beef, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 16 and 69. The Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the ant, in Surah Namal, chapter 27, verse number 17 and 18. The Quran speaks about embryology, the Quran speaks about genetics, the Quran speaks about fingerprinting method, and you can go on and on and on. Though the Quran is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, but there are more than a thousand signs I asked in the Quran which speak about science. Alhamdulillah, if you apply the test today of science, no religious scripture will pass the test except the glorious Quran. The Quran is far superior to science. We are not trying to prove the Quran to be a word of God with the help of science. We are trying to prove to the other people, the atheists, the other non-Muslim brothers and sisters, that if you apply the thing which is on top of the world today, science, and compare it with the Quran, you will find that our yastik, the Quran, is far superior to your yastik, which is the science. 
today we have the problem of gender, gender equity. And I believe it has also, it's there throughout the world, including in this country, South Africa, the gender equity. Islam is the only religion which gave proper equal rights to men and women. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, was the major benefactor, was actually uplifted the women. And in Islam, men and women are equal. But equality doesn't mean identicality. Men and women are equal, but they are not identical. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, has made man and woman different. Physiologically they are different, psychologically they are different, biologically they are different. Depending upon each individual's different nature, Allah has given them different roles. Many a times they are the same, many a times they differ. Overall, man and woman is equal in Islam. But equality doesn't mean identicality. Time will not permit me to go into all the women's rights in Islam. For those who would like to have more information, they can surely refer to my video cassette, Women's Rights in Islam, Modernizing Outdated. And more information on science, Quran and modern science conflict reconciliation. But just to prove my point, that in Islam, man and woman are equal, I'd like to give you an example. Let's suppose two students, they come out first in the class, both get 80 out of 100. Both get 80%. And when you analyze the answer paper, it has 10 answers, each answer carrying 10 marks. In answer to question number 1, student A gets 9 out of 10. Student B gets 7 out of 10. So in answer 1, student A has advantage over student B. In answer to question number 2, student B gets 9 out of 10. And student A gets 7 out of 10. So in answer to question B, student B, in, in answer to question 2, student B has advantage over student A. In all the remaining 8 answers, from question number 3 to question number 10, both get 8 out of 10. If you add up the marks, both get 80 out of 100. But, in answer to question 1, student A has a degree of advantage over B. In answer to question 2, student B has a degree of advantage over A. But overall they are equal. Similarly in Islam, Depending upon the physical nature, the biological nature, the psychological makeup of the men and women, overall both are equal. But in some aspects, the men have a degree of advantage. In some aspects, the women have a degree of advantage. For example, if a robber enters my house, I will not say, I believe in equality in men and women. I believe in women's liberation, therefore I send my wife to fight the robber. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa chapter 4, 35, that Allah has given men more strength than the other. So it's our job to protect them. So as far as physical strength is concerned, the protecting the woman is concerned, the men have a degree of advantage. On the other hand, our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, in the book of Adab, chapter number 2, hadith number 2, a person approached the Prophet and asked him that, O oh Prophet, who deserves the maximum love and companionship in this world? And the Prophet said, Your mother. The man asked, Who next? The Prophet said, Your mother. The man asked, After that who? The Prophet again said, Your mother. The man asked, After that who? Then the Prophet said, Your father. In short, 75% of love and companionship goes to the mother, 25% to the father. Three-fourth portion of love and companionship goes to the mother, one-fourth goes to the father. In short, the mother gets the gold medal, she gets the silver medal, as well as the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the mere consolation prize. <laughs> so in Islam, men and women are overall equal. And it's correct if you analyze, because the amount of pain that a mother has taken, only for the nine months that she has borne you, even if you give all the wealth in the world, it cannot compensate for the nine months that she has borne you in the womb. This is Islam. So overall, men and women are equal. The Western society, the Western talk of women's liberalization is nothing but a disguised form of exploitation of a body, deprivation of a soul, and degradation of honor. The Western society claiming to uplift women has actually degraded her to a status of mistresses, of concubine. 
of that of society butterfly which are mere tools in the hands of pleasure seekers and sex marketers which are hidden behind the colorful screen of art and culture islam uplifted the women alhamdulillah and has given them equal rights as compared to men what is due based on the physiology biology as well as the psychology of makeup this was just in brief a few just the highlights of the highlights of what islam can offer to humanity as compared to the other religions i like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the glorious quran from surah nahl chapter number 16 verse 125 which says odu ila sabli rabbika bi hikma wal mu'azzat al hasna wa jadil bil lati ahsan in which all the way of thy lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin sazakal i thank you dr sazakal mike for that very informative talk Uh, we now have uh, question and answer time. I would go straight into it because of our constraint of time. We want to make maximum use of our question period. The floor is open. Salaam. Dr. Sir, there's great controversy with regards to cloning. Now, what answer does a Muslim give the skeptic or a scientist as such with regards to cloning? This is up. Point number one. that no word does the quran say that cloning can take place or cloning cannot take place so whether cloning takes place or doesn't take place it will not change the state of the quran so cloning hasn't taken place in human beings so far a couple of years back they were able to do it in dolly in the shishi and they say okay now there are high possibilities that it can be done in human beings though the test has failed they didn't know that it going to fail the thought will be exactly the same it didn't take place but it is correct whether cloning takes place or not it will not change the state of the quran what the ulama say and the scholars which agree with them that you should not indulge in such activities because as the quran says do not change unnecessarily the physiology of the body so we should not indulge in these activities unnecessarily for academic purposes what does the quran say in surah tur chapter number 52 verse number 35 that can you create something from nothing And the answer is no. You can't create something from nothing. Allah challenges to create a living creature from nothing, and you cannot do it. Even in cloning, the cells are taken from the she shape it was taken. Even if it's done in any animal or human being, the cells will be taken. The cells have got life, which has been given by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. The challenge is create a living creature without Allah's help. You give it life, and you will do it. And Allah gives a challenge in Surah Hajj, chapter twenty-two, verse seventy-three, that if all those who you call upon for protection, if they gather together, they will not even be able to create a fly. He was like create a human being. Allah says they can't even create a fly. And if the fly snatches away something, they won't even be able to get it back. Feeble are those who petition, and feeble are those to whom they petition. Hope that's the question. Yes, sir. If any sisters have any questions, they will. If you still have any questions, we can have one from the brother side, one from the sister side. No, sorry, no. Uh, no about no, no, no. the organ transplants, giving of organs, and you know, taking of organs is it permitted in Islam? There are various conferences that are taking place, and based on what knowledge scholars have got together, they have agreed that organ transplantation, organ donation, can be done as long as three criteria are fulfilled. Number one. The person who is receiving the organ, it should be a major benefit for his health, or should save his life. Point number two: the person donating the organ, it will not, it should not cause a major loss to his health, or should not cause death to him. Like if I donate my heart, I will die, so I can't donate my heart. But doctors say that one kidney is sufficient for a person to survive, and if my relative, if my mother has suppose both the kidneys are failed, I can very well give my one kidney to her. So it should not cause a major loss. to your health or damage to your life the third is it should not be done for economic reasons it should not be done for money i want to sell my kidney and you give me 100000 nands that's not allowed if these three criteria are fulfilled organ transplantation and donation can be done hope that's the question the other out the following question what if a person dies if he dies whether he take organ or not it will not cause damage he is already dead so what now is last day dead If you give permission, you can utilize those organs which can be utilized to save the life or benefit of the health of any other human being. Hope that answers the question. 
feel you give a simple uh, question in return even in the most advanced societies we find for example if they have a tennis uh, championship like the french open my question is if if the west or the critics of islam believe that men and women are, can do everything the same then why not take equality to its absolute limits as they suggest and have mixed matches where a male versus a female but they don't because they know that in essence we are created such that we are different and and i question this even in local context we have a community marathon running but we give a separate medal to the female runner that comes in as different from the male so although um the west claims that there is gender uh, equality and tries to stretch it into gender identicality but practically in every society from american society down you will not find a boxer that is boxing a male boxer boxing a female so the attributes that allah subhanahu wa taala has created us with alhamdulillah he knows best and therefore he has created certain differences certain restrictions in every sphere uh um, involving men and women and i think you know when we face this instead of backing down which sometimes we do we have to take the challenge and take it forward to others and and explain to them why it is the way it is jazakallah jazakallah mashallah this has been a very good contribution to add to her what she has said and i agree with her and i do use this that why don't we have a boxing match with a man or a woman and athletic competition but to show the difference more you give one more example where it comes to studies we have a competition with man and woman so there we agree that they equal when we have an examination we will have separate examination for ladies and separate examination for gents in a classroom the person who comes out first may be lady may be gent so there they agree they equal so to show them that see in many competition you agree them to be equal but in sports you don't agree them to be equal so we have to show the difference similar in islam in many aspects we agree women are the same like they have to offer salah we have to offer salah they have to give zakat we have to give zakat they have to fast we have to fast but some aspects they are biologically different similarly in competition with the western world have in many times they are same but many times like sports like boxing etc they don't have to the local sister and i hope you can use this additional point so it makes the difference more vast yeah yeah i know more resistant to diseases is it quite true as a scientist and as a an islamic scholar we could know much about it yes, yes brother it has a proven fact cross can you pretty addition he will tell you that the female can fight the germs and diseases in the younger age even when they grow up they can fight the germs and diseases and toxins much better than the male the female is the stronger sex as far as medical thing is concerned hope that's the question as i said in some aspect they have a degree of advantage some aspect physically the male is stronger as come to medically the female is stronger and a female on average lives longer than a male on average a couple of years on average she lives longer than a male that's uh, that's the first question the first question was they got a bigger gray matter that's right for all that they have bigger gray matter yeah that's also been proven any the questions ഫൈറ്റ്സ്റ്റ്യൻ <laughs> that when the christians have this process processions and you know these groupings and that and they pray and they can put people right and put this right is there anything that we can use against that so sir as the question that when the christians have healing sessions healing rallies hundreds of thousands of people can we use in the quran to prove a point if we can find in the bible that's the better so why not use from the bible The Bible says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number twenty-four, verse number twenty-four, there shall arise many false Christs and false prophets, and if it were possible, and they shall do many wonders and miracles, and if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. That means miracle is not the test. Bible says Jesus Christ, the one Himself said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number twenty-four, verse number twenty-four, there shall arise many false Christs and false prophets. 
and shall do wonders and miracles and if it were possible shall deceive the very elect so miracle is not the test at all john the baptist upon the jesus christ speaks upon he said that a person there's no person who's born greater than john the baptist out of a mother whom there is no human being born who's greater than john the baptist which miracle did john the baptist did so miracle is not the test and regarding the healing session there's a video cassette in our i think it's available here also i think i got it from here it is a it is a video cassette on on miracle healing i think the ipc may be having it inshallah it's a video cassette on 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 healing session and it exposes it's a candid camera kept in the healing sessions and it exposes the way they work <clears throat> for example there is a big healing session and in the front row there is a person who is a lame person sitting with a stick so the healer comes and says he takes the stick and he throws it away and says in the name of jesus start walking and the person starts walking the joke was the stick was kept in between two chairs the person who was actually lame was the other person and the person who starts walking is the person who is not lame but the audience doesn't know a person comes who he cannot see and then he starts reading so all these are gimmicks just planted by them i tell this christian missionary that i am a medical doctor why don't you come to the hospitals if you can really heal the people you will get ready made customers you don't have to have healing session in the healing session we get one or two come to the hospital and cure why do we require all these hospitals and it is based on a verse of the gospel of mark chapter number 16 verse number 17 which says that it gives a test for a believer that a christian believer he will have signs that in the name of god he will cast out devils and he will speak in foreign tongues when he drinks deadly poison it will not harm him and if he touches the sick the sick shall be cured this is the test which i used it which i did that all we use it i used the different angle with my debate dr william campbell which i had just last month on the 1st of april with allah's help it was successful based on this they say if you lay your hand on the sick the sick will be cured then even if we have one christian believer in every city of the world why do we require the hospital the primary health center why do we require research center for curing of aids and curing of cancer if a christian believer is really a believer he places the hand on the sick the sick will get cured so why do the christian ask these healers why do the christian missionaries spend so much money millions of dollars in all these hospitals even the christian missionary ring the hospitals even the christian believers so if you can really heal then why do you require these hospitals why do you require research centers where they are spending billions of dollars in research cure of aids cure of cancer it is nothing but a gimmick it's a hogwash trying to deceive the people in the as the quran says who is shafi it is allah who cures it is allah who cures and we should have faith in allah subhanahu wa taala hogan subhanahu wa taala has found that in the Quran there is an interlocking system based on the figure 19 on the number 19 what is the significance of this the brother asked the question that Rashad Khalifa has made the interlocking system on 19 and this is which has promoted based on the Quranic verse of Surah Muzammil chapter 74 verse number 30 that over it are 19 and uncle did that unfortunately he took this material and he wrote a book also al the quran the ultimate miracle which now has been taken off and uncle did that after people told him he realized his mistake and then he challenged professor khalifa the system is wrong come for a debate he didn't come forward this system what he says that how many times bismillah is in the quran 114 times divide by 19 to get the answer 6 how many allah has mentioned from 2300 and odd times divide by 19 to get a figure and everything started to read this is divided by 19 to get a correct figure and he buys quran also 57 dollars divided by 19 to get 3 so everything is based on 19 he says his name is also mentioned 19 times now if you analyze it's logical that if you count from 1 to 100 at least five times you will get 19 and something divisible by 19 19 38 57 so minimum 5% anything you pick up on an average the theory of probability says 5% of the things to have 90 right or wrong so he picked up those 5% thing on average on average and blown it up out of proportion how many gods are there 19 gods how many gods are there only one god is there 
So like that, if you want to attack him, attack him, you should attack him. You can attack him 20 times more. The things which are not 90. The last and final messenger. How many? One. So this way, if you analyze, he just plays the psychology. It is uh, by philosophy also to try and get digits out of it and try and prove it like how the Christians have done. Divisible the bill by seven and divisible bill by this and that. It keeps on coming. It came unfortunately even, even in Islam by Shad Khalifa. He is not at all a Muslim. And somebody in the year 1990, I believe, in January 30th, somebody even shot him, killed. So it is not at all a true theory. It is just a big hoax. And there are books written by, if you read the book, by Dr. Bilal Phillips, 19 hoax for history. Now, when they have found out false that what he said was not right, it's not divisible by 90. There are certain equations, there have been mistakes. Where he wants the count is a letter double time, sometimes he counts it one time. When a mistake was found, instead of saying his theory is wrong, in the Khazab he said that the Quran is wrong. No, and he says there are two false verses in the Quran, the last two verses of Surah Tawbah. There are these six people in different parts of the world in Bombay. And they are there on the internet now. They are there on the internet. And believe me, Wallah, if you are not well versed with Islam, you will get caught. They pose 19 questions again in the Quran, and the whole mass put together, most of them they cannot answer. They, put, they pose questions again in the Hadith. When I go to Saudi Arabia, the Sheikhs, Sheikhs is a big businessman, well versed. This was a very good site, such a logical site. I read a couple of lines. This side belongs to Rashad Khalifa. He said, no, no, no. What logical? I said, brother, go back and see again. It is the submitters. They call them the submitters. Muslim means one who submits. They decide the submitters. Submitters dot 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 com. You get there. They are catching fish. So unless you are, even those who are believers with Islam, they play in such an intelligent manner that they trap you. Therefore, we have to be careful of such people. And Uncle did that rightly after took away the book and produced a better book, Al Quran, uh, the ultimate, um, Al Quran, the miracle of miracles. And then he challenged Rashad Khalifa when he was alive, Rashad Khalifa, but naturally couldn't face the truth. He didn't come forth for the debate, and that's how Shaykh Didat retrieved his book. But unfortunately, there are some Muslim publishers who have published it. After we tell them it is wrong, oh, we have already spent so many thousand rands. How can we take it back? It's a pity. And may Allah give these people to that. Hope that's the question. Yes, sir. 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 Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. Um, with regard to the women's issues, um, on the issue of treatment of women, we know that Islam says that women should be treated with great kindness. And often the argument is used that if Islam says that, why does the Quran even mention the word beating? Even if it says beat lightly, beat heavily, but the word beating has very negative connotations. Why does Islam not say don't beat? Why does it say beat lightly? What is your response to that? Sister, the question that the force against Islam, the use that though Islam is equal at men, I mean, why does it say that you can beat her? She referred to the verse of the Quran from Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 35. It does say that, you know, if you don't get wrong, she doesn't obey you, you don't share, you can scold her directly, you don't share the bed, and then beat. The word, Arabic word used there is Zaraba which means beat lightly, why does it use? And if you go to the hadith, it says the prophet has given various criteria that if you beat, like example, like uh, 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 miswah, like a tubdash, or like a hanky, beat lightly, not to beat on the face, there should not be marked left, etc. various criteria. The reason for it is because I consider it, it to be a symbolic beating. I consider it to be a symbolic beating Symbolic means so that they know this is the final thing, a final warning. Because Quran says that before any problem has takes place with the husband and wife, not just divorce, divorce, salak, salak, it says put an arbiter between. First, try and tell your wife directly, then you may travel, then put an arbiter. These are ways. So this is the final warning. This is a symbolic warning. Should not leave any mark on the body, should not beat the face, should be lightly. All these are given. It's a symbolic warning. Again, if you read the previous verse, Surah Nisa chapter 4, 34, which says, Ar vijalu kawaman al nisa, that the men are the supporters of the women, meaning that they are supposed to protect them, because Allah has given them more strength than the women. And based on this, since Allah has given physical strength more to the man, if he has to use certain things to warn them, it has to be physical strength. 
Woman hasn't been more physical than on a normal level, on an average level, as compared to the man. Based on this, I feel that if the man has to give an ultimatum, I feel that doesn't mean that women are degraded or they aren't getting equal rights, etc. The same way, if I can argue with a say someone that how is Islam given three times more companionship to the mother? You know, I earn the money, I spoil, and we go and earn so much, and we look after them, we give them money, and just, just nine months they're bearing and they get so much. It is based on reason and logic. But the nine months that the mother bears, the child in the womb, is more than all the wealth put together that you can give. Similarly here, if you have to give a warning to the wife, the symbolic can be because a man has got more physical strength, therefore it is used as a symbolic uh, uh, gesture. Hope that's the question. Question from Jens and two from ladies. Inshallah. Two from Jens and two from ladies. Inshallah. Rahman Rahim. I'll make it as brief as possible, Doctor. There's a common fault with our speakers, our alim, and our learned people who appear on TV and radio. Correctly, they start off with Bismillah Rahman Rahim in the name of Allah, the beneficent and merciful. Now, you must take one very major uh, important lesson from this that you're speaking to a non-Muslim crowd, basically, and just correctly say Allah, but the right, correct word is Allah because there is no Allah, uh, no, if you say God, then there is Godlings, God, Goddess, etc., etc. But why don't they make it clear to the public that we're talking about the Almighty God, Allah, because they leave the audience with the feeling that the Muslims, their God is Allah, like they, they, they put you in the boiling pot with everybody else to say, you see, the Muslim's God is Allah and it's not the Almighty God we're talking about. And since we have so many guys here, so many learned people here, it's a very common mistake. Will you please take note? If I'm giving five minutes on TV, like I'll give five minutes on television. Five minutes I'll give, five minutes. So if I say, Alhamdulillah, Allah has come. If I only describe Allah, then every time I appear on TV, I'll only be talking Allah is Almighty God, Allah is Almighty God. We have to realize that sometimes I have spoken on this topic, I have spoken on this topic and described in detail. But if I expect every time I use the word Allah, I clarify the misconception throughout my life. If I five or ten minutes, I spend time only on describing Allah. So you should realize that therefore we have question answers. Right? Like I'm on the TV, I'm on the radio. On the radio, I was there for a couple of minutes today morning. Today morning on Cape Town today I was there on telephone just for a couple of minutes because I'm just going to go there and have a lecture tour in Cape Town and then have a discussion for maybe two hours on the radio. Now if I'm going to speak for just a couple of minutes, I don't have time to clarify Allah. So it's taken for granted that it's not required every time. But when a question is posed, they should clarify it. And if the topic is pertaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he has to describe what you described me in that short time, no non-Muslim will be clarified by your description. I knew it, what the answer is. That don't, we don't use God, we use Allah, because God can be played around with. You can add an S to God, it becomes God. Allah has got no, it takes more than five minutes. And for me, to do it properly, it takes about ten minutes. I don't prefer doing like you, half, half big job. Like what you did, I know the answer. I know what I'm trying to say. But if I say only that much, on the TV I get more confusion. What is the first some or the other time he should say and should clarify and if the topic is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then he should make it a point to clarify. Hope that answers the question. Can a non-Muslim who revert to Islam be a true Muslim uh, if that person still holds on to the traditional religion? Whether that was the question that can a non-Muslim be a true Muslim if he reverts to Islam and if he holds back to his traditional religion? Depending upon what his traditional religion is if his traditional religion doesn't go against Islam, then he can be a true Muslim. If the traditional religion doesn't go against the Sharia, for example, one may be in a village, just knowing there is God, he has got no son, he has got no power, but not following Toto. And he accepts Islam, and he comes to know what he was thinking was right, but he has come to know something additional. Oh, Muhammad is also there. So he becomes a Muslim, and he holds back to his traditional religion. So basically, when he comes to Islam, he should not break any rules of the Islamic Sharia. If his tradition doesn't work in the Islamic Sharia, he can continue with the tradition. But if the tradition goes away wearing a coat, he's wearing a tie, and he becomes a Muslim. Oh, tie haram. Where it's mentioned haram? There's no verse in the Bible where tie is haram. There's no verse in Christian scripture where tie is haram. This is the Muslim law against the Western world. Anything they do, haram. Telephone, haram. TV, haram. So tie has come. 
So the thing is that if a person wears a tie, he has remained the Muslim. So depending upon what his tradition and religion is, if it goes against the basic concept of Islam, then he is not a true Muslim. If it doesn't go, Alhamdulillah, can continue, there's no problem. Hope that answers the question. Wa'akhru da'wana, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Jazakallah, thank you so much. Uh, just bear with me for one minute, sisters, brothers and sisters. I just want to thank uh, our two distinguished guests, Dr. Zaki Naik and Dr. Shoaib. Thank you for uh, honoring this country with your visit. And uh, you have made a major contribution to uh, our soil. We, we are praying for that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you and guide you and uh, strengthen you and give you the lifespan inshallah to continue this work and also to strengthen your center and uh, inshallah may we get the opportunities inshallah to uh, work with you much closer there are so many organizations in our country also I would like to thank the organizations here today uh, there the is this cooperation that we are that we have with one another and I think it is a very good beginning uh, that, that is how you build this kind of unity that we are looking forward to in our community thank you for coming I want to thank all of you I want to also thank uh, Sheikh uh, uh, Shamas here for uh, coming he always responds respond to our request to him to come and recite for us thank you so much for coming we also would like uh, to thank the Islamic Dao movement for making it possible to bring uh, Dr. Zaki and I. We will uh, end this program by reciting well, us. It was the practice of the, the companions when they meet one another and they disperse, they recite it well, us. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Well, us. Inna l-insana lafiqus. Inna al-ladina amanu wa amilu salihat. Wa tawasu bil-haq. Wa tawasu bil-sabr. Jazakumullah. Thank you so much.